Hi guys, James at Rampant Line Reviews again for you today with another beer review. For this one, we are going to have a look at another collaboration beer. So this one is half English on the home side, half Swedish on the away side. Both breweries have featured on the channel before, albeit the Swedish brewery has featured many more times than the English one. I think this will be my third review involving the English brewery and probably like my 35th or something involving the Swedish brewery. But I have actually reviewed a collaboration between both of these breweries before, which was quite nice. So I'm Curious to see how this one turns out. Both breweries have a very good reputation and uh, I'm sure this one will be quite an interesting beer. This is yet another one that I picked up from the House of Trembling Madness down in New York in England. So for this one then we are going to head down to Suffolk to a little place called Badley and we're having a look at another beer from Burnt Mill Brewery. So this one is called Skog. It comes in at 7% ABV and this one is a New England hazy style IPA brewed in collaboration with the wonderful Dugas Brig who are from Landvetter, just outside of Gothenburg on the west coast of Sweden, a brewery that I know very, very well. So, um, yeah, I actually reviewed maybe about a year ago, but less than that, maybe a beer called uh, Dima, which came through the um, the Tilferig Sortiment in Sistembolaget in Sweden. That was also a collaboration between these guys. I think it had been released in England uh, a little bit earlier. Uh, to be honest with you. But uh, yeah, so that was the last beer that I reviewed involving Burnt Mill Brewery. And then when I saw they'd done another collaboration with Dugas, I thought, well, I need to review that when I'm home. So that was the main reason I picked this one when I made the order uh, through there, because I knew I wanted to try something from Burnt Mill, because these guys do some uh, some very, very nice beers. But it's not a brewery that I get the chance to try things from uh, all that often. And I know Dugas are very, very good. But um, yeah, very, very curious to see how this one turns out. Uh, both breweries have a very, very good reputation in their respective countries these days. Both quite well known for the hazy New England IPAs, actually, although Dugas were originally known for their big kind of imperial stouts and fruity sours and stuff like this. But uh, Burnt Mill is very close to my good friend J. Cole over at J. Cole Beer. Um, do make sure that you check out his channel. I'll try to remember to put the link to that in the video description below. But he's got some really nice videos there. I love his style. He does a little bit of editing and things, and he just describes his videos as him being silly on, uh, on YouTube. And I do like that. I do like his videos they're always quite fun to watch actually um, so yeah do make sure you check out his channel and give him a like and subscribe and things like that but definitely nice to return to Burnt Mill once again and uh, always nice to review something else from Dugas Brewery as well but um, yeah let's see how we get on with this one then so as always with my reviews I'll tell you a little bit about the breweries involved here before we taste the beer if you want to get straight to the tasting just fast forward all the usual links are in the video description below that's the brewery website so the link to my other reviews that I've done both from Burnt Mill Brewery and from Dugas Brewery. You will no doubt see more added to yeah. both of those lists at some point in the near future, but you are far more likely to see reviews from Dugas sooner than, uh, than Burnt Mill, just because. But um, as always, um, you can go into the channel and check out all the different beers that I've done from these guys. Uh, you can check out the playlists of beers from different countries. There is one there for both the Swedish beers that I've reviewed for you and another one for the English beers. This beer will appear in both of those because it is dual nationality. And as always, please do get in touch and let me know some of the other beers and breweries that you guys would like to see me review. It's always great to hear from you guys that are watching the videos and the support that you show the channel is hugely appreciated. And there is all the usual social media in there as well. But um, yeah, let's start with the home brewery in this case then, which which is Burnt Mill Brewery. So as I've mentioned to you already, Burnt Mill Brewery are based in Badley in Suffolk, which is to the northwest of Ipswich, kind of northeast-ish of London, I guess you could say. But the brewery was founded by Charles O'Reilly, and he first started releasing his beers back in 2017. So Charles apparently discovered uh, the Sierra Nevada beers, and this was what really kind of kicked him off on his craft beer journey. But after this, he started seeking out lots of different world beers, and he spent a lot of time at Kernel and Brew by Numbers when he lived in London. He then got into home brewing a little bit later on and his first beer apparently was a clone of the Kernel Double Citra and he says he's been learning about beer since roughly around 2011. But Charles was apparently drawn to Badly by the fact that he could brew beer with grains that were produced on the local farms and they're also very close to their maltery as well, which is Muntins. That's quite a well-known um, English maltery actually. Um, but over the years they've continued to uh, build up the brewery in the old kind of farm 
premises that they have and the brewery currently boasts a 15 BBL brew kit and numerous different fermentation tanks and again that's going to be built up further over the years um, but the current head brewer is Sophie Durand who was apparently one of the founders of the International Women's Collaboration Brew Day and she has a wealth of experience across the beer industry and that's probably part of the reason why these guys have done so well from such an early stage but the artwork on the cans is apparently designed by Josh Smith and as of January 2021 when I'm filming this review for you Burnt Mill have released around 110 different beers so far. Um, like I said to you, these guys have done quite a lot of hazy New England IPAs. Um, I've seen a few black IPAs and various other interesting things released from these guys over the last little while, so they aren't, sim they aren't just focusing on these hazy New England IPAs as some breweries are doing, but they are producing uh, quite a few different things as well. If you do want to see more Burnt Mill reviews, as I said earlier, you can check out my friend Jake over at uh, Jayco beer reviews he's done quite a few things from these guys so uh, yeah hopefully I can do like a collaboration review of a burnt mill beer with um, with Jake at some stage it'd be nice hopefully when I go down to London and meet Craig at Kent Beer Reviews hopefully um, the three of us can actually do a little bit of out and about filming together that would be really really fun but um, yeah I think that will be That'll be quite nice when we can sort it out, but definitely nice to return to Burnt Mill for my third review and uh, I will see about getting a few of their beers next time to do, you know, dedicated reviews only to, uh, to Burnt Mill, of course, but this is one that I thought would be very nice to review on the channel this time. So, um, yeah, that's all I can really tell you about Burnt Mill Brewery for the moment. If you want to learn more about these guys, you can check out the brewery website, follow them on Facebook and Instagram to keep up to date with all the latest goings on, and you can check out the Rate Beer, Untapped and Beer Advocate pages to learn more about all those 110 different beers they've done thus far but yeah let's go on to the away side then on to the Swedish side of this beer so Dugas Bregere as I've mentioned to you many a time before are based in Landvetter quite close to the airport on the outskirts of Gothenburg on the west coast of Sweden the Swedish craft beer capital as I've always told you as well um, but this brewery was established back in 2005 in Mölndal to the south of the city by Mikael Engström Duja whom of course it takes its name from but a few years prior to this Mikael had met an Englishman who was selling various different you know pieces of brew kits around Sweden uh, and this really just got him thinking about brewing his own beer so he studied the Swedish alcohol laws which admittedly are where and are I guess you should say very very complex he visited other breweries around the country and started buying up equipment and this whole kind of venture if you like culminated in the opening of their first brewery in Mullendal in 2005 as I said earlier over the coming years they continued to build up this facility but they did uh, by 2009 outgrow this place basically and then the following year in 2010 they moved to and Vetter um, and uh, had a far bigger brewery but the older brewery had a capacity of 1500 hectolitres per year but the new brewery started off with a capacity of 8000 hectolitres per year and this has more than doubled in recent years. Um, over the years the brewery became very well known for their fruit and sour beers uh, and also for their imperial stouts as well. Dugis I believe used to have the official name Dugis Ull or Porter Brewery um, but yeah Tropic Thunder is a kind of Swedish classic beer these days that's one that I would always recommend uh, and also so the Idiot Imperial Stout, those are probably the two must-have classic beers from, uh, from Dugas Brewery. I'm not sure if you can still get both of those through System Bolaga. I think you still get the Tropic Thunder, but um, Idiot, I think, is a little bit more difficult to get a hold of. I think you're more likely to find Big Idiot these days, which is a slightly um, stronger version. But those are two must-have classic Dugas beers, in my opinion. But uh, more recently... They've been investing a lot in their barrel aging program, uh, which is called the Future Series, if I remember rightly. And uh, they've also been producing a lot of IPAs. They've got the Crush and the Fresh Series, which are the hazy New England styles. And then they've also got the Bite Series, which is their West Coast IPA series as well. Um, but yeah, I've had some really, really nice beers from Dugas over the years. Um, you get some really quirky things from these guys, actually. And pretty much anything that Dugas try, they tend to do very, very well with. They're not scared to try different styles. And I would say that that's one of the main reasons why they are one of my favourite Swedish breweries, in fact. They're also the co-owners of the two Brewers Beer Bars in, uh, in Gothenburg. Uh, they own those along with um, All In Brewery, who are one of the numerous gypsy breweries that operate around Gothenburg. And I believe uh, Electric Nurse Brewery are also owners of those as well. And Electric Nurse is run by Mikael Engström Duge's uh, daughter, Ida, and her husband, John, who is from England. So yeah, there's actually quite a bit of a, an English connection uh, with the with Dugas here actually because Dugas do have an English brewer now and she's very talented from what I've seen so far. Um, she was at Five Points Brewery in London for quite a wee while and um, yeah that's and obviously John um, 
John um, Mikael's son-in-law is English too. So there's quite a close tie between Dugas Brewery and England, of course. But um, yeah, awesome brewery. And these guys are one of the Swedish brewers that I would always recommend to people that are interested in Swedish beer. The last two beers I reviewed from those guys were the Lux and the Lusher Crusher, both of which were um, English, uh, New England. IPAs. But um, yeah, that's all I can really tell you about Dugas Brewery for the moment. They've always got some really interesting beers coming out and uh, I do recommend that you try some of their beers. But if you want to learn more about this brewery, you can check out the brewery websites, follow them on Facebook and Instagram to keep up to date with all the latest goings on and you can of course check out the Rate Beer Untapped and Beer Advocate pages to learn more about all the different beers that Dugas have done. Although I would say the number of beers that have been released by Dugas far exceeds the number that is actually listed on Untapped, because um, Dugas are a very, very prolific brewery, but the number that's listed there for some reason um, is wrong. It says they've only released about 60 beers, and that's rubbish. They've released far more than that. But um, yeah, let's leave it at that for the brewery histories, and let's get on and actually have a taste of this beer then. Very, very curious to see how this one turns out. But um, yeah, the artwork on this one, I have to say, is pretty cool actually. I like it how the water, yeah, if you actually feel this can, the water part of it and the sky is smooth, but the forest is, it's, it's almost more like a kind of satin finish actually, if you like. So yeah, this is like a more silky finish, a more satiny finish. But yeah, um, if you're wondering why there's river and trees in this, the word skog in uh, Swedish is forest, woods, basically. So yeah, that's the reason why you have this one. Uh, you have this beer with this lovely artwork on it. And uh, yeah, most of Sweden is actually covered by forest and mountains, or both, if you like. Um, but um, yeah, really nicely presented. This one you can see on the top of the can there, there is the Burnt Mill Brewery symbol. And if we shugle it round, there you can see the Dugas Brewery symbol. It says on the back here, we are drawing from the Nordic winter uh, for direction for this collab with our good friends Dugas Brew uh, Dugas Brewery. It's weird to say Dugas Brewery and not Dugas Brewery, I have to say. But this one says a soft pillowy base from extra pale oats and chit malt, and it gives a platform for a hot combination of Idaho, Talus, Simcoe, Cashmere, and Centennial to deliver big juicy aromas of pine and citrus. Um, but um, yeah, it looks very, very nice, I have to say. 7% ABV, I can't remember if I did say that at the start of the video, but yeah, um, Skog New England Hazy IPA, 7% ABV. But um, yeah, I think this one will be really nice. We know all of these hops fairly well, except Talus. Talus is quite new. Idaho 7, we know uh, roughly about 13, 14% alpha acid. Lots of lovely soft stone fruity tropical fruit kind of things in there. Simcoe, about 11, 12% alpha acid. Soft passion fruit. Cashmere has a lovely melony, lemon lime kind of thing to it. I think that's about 12% alpha acid as well. Centennial, big, you know, quite intense limey notes out of that, about 11% alpha acid. Talus, of course, is a daughter of Sabro, and it's quite woody. It's got quite a kind of bright grapefruity character to it, and it's almost a little bit pine resinous and spicy from uh, from what I remember. But um, yeah, Talus is a very, very new hop on the block, and I think that'll make it really quite interesting, actually. But yeah, Skog, New England IPA, 7% ABV, a collaboration between Burnt Mill Brewery and... Um, how, how do we say this place again? Is it Bagby? Bagby? Badly, sorry, Badly, uh, near Ipswich in Suffolk in England, and at Dugas Brewery from Landvater um, to the northeast of Gothenburg on the west coast of Sweden. Let's get this guy out and we'll get on with the tasting. 440 milliliter can, incidentally, and uh, I think I paid right five, six pounds for this once again. So in Swedish kroners, that will be roughly about 70 ish Swedish kroner. Um, so what will that be? Maybe about eight. American dollars for the can, something like that, and um, yeah, about seven euros, roughly, seven euros. So yeah, let's get this guy out, and we'll get on with the tasting then. Definitely nice to have Burnt Mill Brewery on the channel once again, and always nice to review something new from Dugas Brewery as well. But I think we've got most of the beer in the can there, let me just check that it's sitting there nicely. But um, yeah, this I think will be pretty nice. This one's got a very, very rich looking colour to it as well. You can see that. Um, yeah, this has got a lovely, very kind of rich yellow colour to it. It looks, looks like a very nice kind of mango juice. But in fairness, you maybe could pass this one off as a kind of blended tropical juice, actually. I always like comparing these New England IPAs to tropical fruit juices because that's really just what they remind me of. You can see that the beer poured with um, about one half a finger of what I would describe as a kind of cream coloured head. It's actually quite a bumpy head. The bubbles there are quite big rather than being quite small and you know fluffy looking. So it's a little bit 
I wouldn't describe it as bumpy, but it's not the fluffiest of heads that I've seen, but not that that particularly matters. There's one or two big bubbles sticking towards the side of the glass there, but I do think I got the glass plate pretty clean this time. Um, but even if you do clean it and rinse it, let it sit for half an hour or something, you still get uh, carbonation sticking to it. Beer is very, very sensitive, of course. But yeah, lovely, rich uh, colour to this one. And this is pretty hazy, actually, but not the haziest. Uh, of beers that I've seen at 7% ABV. Um, yeah, I've had I've been reviewing a few um, New England IPAs recently, and this isn't one of the soupier and gloopier ones I've come across in this round of uh, reviews that I've been doing at home. Uh, I've had one that was 5% that was a little bit hazier than this, actually. But remember, the level of haze in your New England IPAs depends on the amount of wheat and the amount of oats that are used in the um, in the base, but um, yeah, there's a lot, um, you know, there's a lot of things that can change that. The colour of your beer, of course, is also dependent on one, the type of malts you use, and two, the length of the boil. The longer you boil the beer, the more the sugars caramelise, and thus you get a darker colour out of it. But again, dependent on the type of malts that you use. So this one is quite a rich colour, so I would guess that maybe there's a little bit of, you know, like, Cara Pills or Cara Munich or something like that in this because usually New England IPAs they tend to have between a 70 and a 90 minute boil if I remember rightly but yeah in terms of its appearance nothing madly surprising about this beer it certainly looks uh, it certainly looks the part actually nothing uh, untoward I guess you could say about the appearance of this beer so let's take a closer look at the aroma and see how we got on with this one very very curious about this beer I have to say Ooh, <laughs> that does smell quite interesting. Yeah, um, yeah, that's <laughs> that's really really interesting. The fruitiness is the thing that's going to jump out at you right away with this beer, and probably it's the cashmere and the talus that are going to come to the fore on this one. This is quite a citrusy leaning uh, New England IP. I mean, when you've got Centennial in there as well. That's not surprising. Uh, Centennial does have a good little bit of pungency to it. But yeah, we'll come to the fruits at the end. Let's try and focus on the malty side of things as we normally start with. Um, but yeah, straight away with this beer, when you sugar it up, you get a nice, soft, white, bready character out of this one. This is definitely more of a kind of bready leaning New England IPA, in my opinion. Um, soft, white bread in there, a lot of that. If you take the aroma in a little, uh, a little bit more deeply, you will get a little touch of wheat out of this one a little bit of wheaty bitiness but not a lot. This beer actually doesn't contain wheat but you still almost get a little bit of that same type of aroma out of it. If you take it in really deeply you can just feel that that you know you can just feel that little bit of bitiness um, on the wheat in there. Um, but yeah it smells like a very soft kind of white bready um, aroma that you're getting out of this one. Almost you know just almost um, like you know a uh, we call it a tiger loaf actually, it really reminds me of a kind of tiger loaf that my mum used to always get out of Tesco's for us to eat. Um, love that. Love those big kind of tiger loaf things. Um, so yeah, lovely soft white bready character out of this one. The more you smell it, the more you start to get the oats out of it as well. It's got a lovely smooth kind of oaty character to it. And I think that's uh, really quite nice to be honest with you. I wonder if the kind of softness that you're getting out of this one is because of that chip malt. I talked about chip malt in here, which is something I've had it once or twice actually, um, but I've not had um, I've not had too many beers with a chip malt in it. Um, so yeah, I wonder if that real softness that this beer has, just checking on the camera control there, um, I wonder if that softness that this beer has is down to that chip malt. Mm. But yeah, lovely. Um, lovely kind of softness to this beer, absolutely soft white bread, smooth oats to it. Um, it does almost have a wee touch of a like wheaty like, I should say wheaty like because it doesn't actually have wheat in it. Um, it's got a little bit of a wheaty like bitiness at the very back of the nose there, but the malt base strikes me as very straight shooting. Pale malts, a little bit of oat in there, and you do get a wee touch of a kind of Werther's Original type thing coming out of this one. But I would guess going from the colour of this one, unless it has a wee bit of like Cara Munich, or uh, something like that in it. They've maybe done a wee bit of a longer boil uh, on this beer. And I know that Dugas do like a long boil, actually. Because, um, yeah, if it's got this really rich yellow colour and it's only got extra pale, um, if it's only got extra pale oats and then chip malt in it, hmm, that's quite interesting. But chip may well be responsible for the colour. Not a malt that I am overly familiar with, to be quite honest with you. But, yeah, interesting to think about that. But it smells like it's going to be a smooth, soft and bready type malt base we'll get out of this one. But yeah, on to the green side of the hops then. Um, with this one, there's a wee touch of earthiness to it, not a lot. I'd say that the floral aromaticity is the most pungent, um, is the most pungent component 
of the uh, the malt base in this one. I think that's that kind of goes without saying. Yeah, it's really got a it really has quite a, a pungent floral aromaticity to it. It's not spicy or anything, it just really kind of lingers there and smells quite deep actually and I do like that about it. There's a soft grassy component as well um, but it does smell to be honest with you that a lot, most of the hops that are mentioned in here have been used as the, uh, the late, as late edition hops. This beer doesn't smell as if it's going to be madly bitter at all. A um, little bit of floral aromaticity like I said and there's a nice kind of soft um, grassy quality to this beer as well so um, yeah I really like how um, how that goes together the green side of the beer really the softer green side that the that this beer has really fits in well with the um, with the kind of juicy fruity characters actually so uh, as well as the, the kind of soft malt base so let's focus on that fruity side of things now I think this is comes across really nicely but I mean yeah when you take the aroma of this one in you can smell those lovely soft um, things from the Idaho 7 coming out. I think the Idaho 7 is the one that's really forming the backbone of this beer. Um, it's great, that's soft. Um, you get a wee bit of the passion fruit in there, but it's quite a juicy passion fruit rather than being, you know, uh, big and, and, and uh, pungent, if you like, in the same way that you'd get from, say, um, well, Simcoe gives you quite a soft pa passion fruit as well, if you put it in New England IPAs, but like Galaxy for example, Galaxy and El Dorado will both give you a big kick, a big passion fruity kick, whereas Idaho 7 just gives you a lovely soft sort of thing. So there's apricots, there's papayas, um, you know, all of these kind of things in there. Uh, Idaho 7 really smells a little bit like a fruit salad to be honest with you. So you get a lot of that in here. Um, but you can smell a wee bit of the, um, you can smell a little bit of the kind of bright pink grapefruits that you're supposed to get from um, from Talus. I can definitely get a little bit of that. Talus is a little bit lower in alpha acid. I think it's about 10% from what I remember. It was formerly, I think it was 692, HBC 692 uh, was Talus. Um, but yeah, the the fruity side of this beer is, is just lovely actually. Um, yeah, the pink grapefruits, I'm getting more and more of that. The soft, um, you know, the soft papayas, apricots and all these kind of things from the um, soft papayas and apricots and stuff like that from the, um, how would you say, um, brain's not working, from the, the Idaho 7 and then you get the citrusy side of this beer as well which is very very nice. Um, yeah, the you can smell the melon from the from the ca uh, from the cashmere in this one. Um, cashmere's got a very very distinctive aroma. It's it's got a lovely juicy melon quality to it, but then it gives you a really interesting lemon limey quality. It gives you a more juicy limey note as well. So big melon, big limey qualities for me, and then you just get a bit of um, you know lemon underneath that. So yeah, cashmere is a, is a really interesting hop acts. It's very popular in some of the Slovenian beers that I've been reviewing recently actually but you can get a little bit of the punchy lemony qualities out of the Centennial in this beer as well but overall I would say the fruits come across as quite juicy and they're very well balanced between the tropical side of things and the more oily side of things. I mean when you've got Simcoe uh, when you've got Simcoe, Talis and Idaho 7 in there, that's going to give you a good tropical base. But then Cashmere and uh, Centennial are going to give you a very nice uh, citrusy side to the beer as well. I'm very curious about this. Take a bit of time to enjoy the aroma. This has got a lovely soft and oily fruity kind of thing going on. You will very much enjoy it and it always gives you an indicator of what's going to happen when you taste the beer. But let's taste this one now then. This one is the Skog or Forest as you would say in English. 7% New England IPA from Burnt Mill Brewery in Badley. Uh, near Ipswich in Suffolk in England, brewed in collaboration with the wonderful Dugas Brewery from Landvetter, just outside of Gothenburg on the west coast of Sweden. Let's get stuck into this one. Slange, skull, cheers. Oh. That is a solid, solid beer. Um, I really, really like that straight away, I'm just going to say that. Um, it really is very, very nice, but I mean, you wouldn't expect anything less from these two, to be quite honest. Um, solid, solid stuff. Um, yeah, uh, where to start with this one? This one does have a wee bit, um, the malt base in this one is quite interesting, and it's, that chip malt is really giving it something quite different. So let's focus on that first. So yeah, um, 
straight away with this beer, you do get a sort of bready base to this one, but it's almost, um, it almost reminds me, it, it's like a white bread with a little bit of a, whole, a, a, a kind of oat, um, wholemeal sort of tint to it. That's the thing that forms the base of this beer. So the pale malt obviously will be playing a role in that, but um, if you go further towards on the back third of your palate, it gets a little bit more grainy if that makes sense. So the, on the back third of your palate, it definitely feels a bit more grainy and it's a little bit more soft and white bready on the um, on the middle third of your palate. So I really like that about um, how this beer goes together for sure. But yeah, um, the chip malt is adding a really interesting thing. It's got the, it feels like you've got the pale malt kind of forming the backbone of the beer. So middle third of your palate, back third of your palate, pale malt all the way. Back third of your palate, it feels a little bit more bitey and things, almost as if there is a little bit of wheat in here, but um, as far as the can tells us, it doesn't. And that would be one of the things. This can actually does have the Swedish writing and stuff on it, and there is quite strict laws in Sweden. There are quite strict laws in Sweden, I should say, bad English, um, that you know you have to have all the ingredients in there. There would be wheat listed there um, in Swedish if there was, but it does have a little bit of that wheaty-like bitiness on the back third of your palate. And it almost, as you move further forward on that back third of your palate, it is a bit thicker, but it smoothens up. Um, and you've also got um, a really nice... Um, You've also, it also, you can feel the thickness of it just drop away as you move into that middle third of your palate. Um, but yeah, base of the, um, the base on that uh, middle third of your palate, soft white bread, then you get a bit of a kind of crackery thing to it. I think the chip malt is giving you a sort of almost like Jacob's cream cracker sort of thing to it, but maybe just even a little touch more grainy almost. So there is a wee bit of a kind of grainy crackery type thing in the middle third of your palate. There's soft, it's, you know, the pale malt underneath and then just a grainy crackery thing sitting on top of it. But you can feel the nice kind of oaty smoothness um, sitting on top of that actually, which is very, very nice. Yeah, um, the more that you drink of this beer, it does have a nice, the, the, the oatiness comes out of this one a little bit more and the oats actually get very very thick and very creamy in that middle part of your palate as well but if it's only oats in this and it's only you know pale malt and I don't know exactly what the chip malt would do but if you've not got a slightly sweeter malt in there um, the oats are the things that are going to cover the booziness in the beer so you can really feel those oats just getting thicker and thicker um, the further that you go into it which is quite interesting so this beer does develop a bit more of a kind of thick kind of creamy quality the further you go into it so the malt base in this one for me is pretty interesting but um, yeah on the uh, the hoppy side of things then I think we've covered the malty base as much as we really need to but in the back corners of the palate definitely a little bit of earthiness there as you move further forward on the sides of the palate it does develop a nice floral aromaticity all five of the hops that are in here are pretty high alpha. I think the lowest one is actually Talus at 11%, Sip, you know, 10%. Uh, Simcoe's like 11 or so. Idaho 7, I think, is like 12 or 13. Um, Centennial, I think, is 11. Uh, what else is that again? Cashmere. I think Cashmere's like a 13, 14% alpha acid. So, not surprising you're getting a big floral aromaticity of this one. It does almost get a wee touch spicy the further you go into the aftertaste, but it's got a really kind of resinous sort of thing there. And maybe that's the talus that's giving you that. Um, there are almost one or two little woody elements, and that is another thing that I remember having had from Talus before. You do get just a wee bit of woodiness, um, particularly around the front curve of your palate. The front curve of your palate is a little bit woody, but it's also quite kind of grassy in a sense as well, which is uh, which is interesting. But yeah, that I think covers the green side of the beer quite well. Having a little bit more of an aromatic side of the beer does offer a wee bit of contrast again. But um, yeah, let's focus on the fruity side of the beer because I think that's where the more in, the most interesting things are happening. Front third of your palate, as always say, you get that nice little oily bubble where those juicy fruity esters roll their way out of the beer. If you go towards the back of that front third of your palate, it's a little bit of a... Um, it does have a little bit of a kind of stronger kind of grapefruity note to it. I'm guessing that will be the talus that's giving you that, that pink grapefruit. It smells a lot softer in the aroma than it does come across as being in the flavour. It does have a bit of, you know, kind of pungency to it, if that makes sense. But as you move further forward from that, you'll get the slightly softer passion fruit of the, the Simcoe coming out and you can feel 
some of the tropical complexities of the Idaho 7 as well as you move towards um, the halfway point on that front third of your tongue. Um, that's It's really quite nice but I think the talus um, really dominates the tropical side of this beer to be honest. The grapefruity notes really push their way out on this one because Simcoe's normally a lot softer than this and um, you know Idaho 7 is as well so they're adding complexity but I think the talus kind of dominates um, this one in that sense. But um, yeah, on the front half of that front third of your tongue then, this is where you're getting the more oily um, citrusy notes from the cashmere and the centennial for sure. I think the centennial is coming out almost right on the tip of the tongue, those big uh, limey notes, but then you've got the other more oily things um, sitting in behind that, which is, um, which is quite interesting. Yeah. Um, this beer is really nice in that sense. I like that the more that you... I, I'm impressed with this one, I'll say that, I really like this. Because um, it's got quite a few just contrast to it. it. It's got a good level of complexity. I like beers that test your palate and this one does that in a lot of ways. Um, I think it's it really has a sort of... Um, just oiliness to the citrusy qualities there. I mean, you can feel the melon. That front half of that front third of your tongue, you've got a nice kind of melon part just lying underneath. And as you move further forward, it gradually gets more lemony. But you've got a good little bit of lime coming out of this beer as well. I think the lime and the, the, the melon are the things that linger into the aftertaste. But the grapefruit and the lemony citrus that you get out of this one, they really push their way out as well. You've got quite a pungency to this beer leading into the aftertaste as well. This one definitely has... Uh, it's got a bit of graininess to it, it's got a bit of that big citrusy bite to it. Um, it is one of the more citrusy leaning IPAs that I've had um, over the last little while to be honest with you, but I think it's really nicely done. I really do think this has got an interesting um, hop profile to it. So um, so yeah, Cashmere, um, beautiful hop and Talus, but uh, I think those two are dominating over the other ones that are in here. But Centennial, I think, I think it's definitely fair to say that Centennial is playing a role. You do get a nice little bit of that trademark zesty, lemony zesty quality on the front tip of your tongue there, but I do think the Simcoe and the Idaho 7 are sort of suppressed a bit by the other two, um, the other two that are, the, the other ones that are in this beer. Um, I think they, they're just a little bit softer in their characteristics when you put them in an OT malt base like this. But it's a lovely beer this, I certainly like it and it gets a thumbs up from me. It's got a good little bit of complexity to it and it gives you a lot to think about if you're a big beer nerd like me. But um, yeah, mouthfeel wise then to round off the review. Um, yeah, mouthfeel wise this one has um, I'd say it's pretty, it's at the top end of mid-bodied. Um, the carbonation is um, carbonation is very, very smooth in this one, I would say. Um, actually, I'd maybe even say this is bottom end of full-bodied, to be honest with you. It's quite a thick beer, this one, just because it doesn't have like wheat or anything in it or pills or malt or whatever to give it a bit more bite to it. It's a really quite thick beer for a 7 percenter to be honest. So I would say bottom end of full-bodied. Smooth carbonation, though, big kind of creamy mouthfeel. The hoppy bitterness in this one does feel a little bit more. It does feel like it's got a bit of bite, maybe 40 IBUs in this one. Um, I think, yeah, about 40 IBUs. Remember, this is the weakest point of my beer reviews, if you like, though. Um, but yeah, definitely a bit more bitterness to this one. The malt base, as I said, big, thick, kind of creamy qualities, but also a bit of graininess underneath. And the fruits are quite pungent on the grapefruity side of things and quite zesty on the citrusy side of things. Um, and the, two, the softer tropical fruits, you can get a little bit of them but I really think that this the the Simcoe and the Idaho 7 are, they take a little bit of a back seat in this one, to be honest with you. I think they do take a little bit of a back seat compared to uh, the other hops in this one. Uh, I think, yeah, the Talus and the uh, the uh, Cashmere really dominate in this beer for me. But, um, yeah, this is a really interesting one. I've enjoyed reviewing it, and it's nice to see that Burnt Mill and Dugas are still doing collaborations together. So let's leave it at that for this. This was a really good, uh, really nice beer to review. So, um, yeah, once again, thank you for watching my beer reviews. Until the next time, please like, subscribe, share, all the usual YouTube stuff. Let me know your own thoughts on this beer in the comment section below. Let me know what your favourite beers are from Burnt Mill and from Dugas. We will return to both of these breweries at some point soon. I'm sure we'll probably return to Dugas very, very quickly after this review. Burnt Mill, fingers crossed we can get a few more things from them. But uh, yeah, awesome. Uh, definitely awesome to have these guys um, 
collaborating together again. This was a really interesting beer, quite citrusy, uh, this one. So if you like that sort of thing, you will definitely enjoy this beer. So go for it and see how you get on. Thank you again for watching. Check out my social media. Check out Dugas and Burnt Mill Brewery. And I hope that I'll catch you guys again. Make sure you check out my friend Jayco, uh, Jayco Beer as well, because he's got quite a few Burnt Mill reviews up on his channel. Very local brewery to him. But thank you again for watching. Check out my social media, and I'll catch you guys very soon. The Skug. Forest, 7% New England IPA from Burnt Mill Brewery in Badley in Suffolk in England in collaboration with Dugas Brewery from Landvetter just outside of Gothenburg on the west coast of Sweden. Slanja, Skull, cheers.